Do you tell me when? Okay, hello everyone. Ah, um, good afternoon and welcome to this uh, Sussex Development Lecture. My name is Matthias Ramirez. I'm from uh, Spru, in case you don't know, the Sussex Policy Research Unit, which is one of the buildings behind us here. And it's one of the centres or research groups which uh, co-hosts this uh, seminar series together, obviously, with IDS, with Global Studies and with the Institute of Education. So welcome to you all. Um, I think we're very, very lucky today to have uh, Duncan Green. Duncan is Head of Research at Oxfam GB and also no, there's a big no there. And also, well, he can introduce himself afterwards. But I did want to say this, Professor of Practice at the LSE. I think that's a great title. That's right. Maybe maybe I'll take that on if and when in the next life I'm ever promoted. Um, so um, the title of the talk is a really intriguing one. Um, imagining there is no money, it's easy if you try. What could global solidarities look like beyond the big check? I got that one right, didn't I? Yeah. Right, good. Um, and I've had a sneak preview at the slides and they are really, really interesting. I think we're very lucky because uh, I assume you do straddle the movement between academia and practitioner and aid. I think that's very, very important in terms of understanding what we do. And you're going to be talking about aid fundamentally, different ways of understanding aid. This morning I did hear on the radio James Cleverly, the foreign, the new, the, well, new uh, 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 foreign secretary. And when he was asked, uh, why is it that Somalia, which of course is facing now a terrible situation, the aid is only 25% today of what it was a number of years ago. He completely dodged the situation, made no commitment whatsoever. So um, I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm going to pass over to, to Duncan. Uh, we have until um, 4.45 and then we're going to have a Q&A uh, and that will take us over to, to 5.30. Yeah. Thank you. Are you using the same one? Oh, no, come on. I'm going to move over here. Thanks, Matthias. Uh, hi, everybody. So exciting to be back in the room with people and a lovely day. We should all be outside. Thanks for sacrificing uh, and coming inside and said, um, yeah, just to clarify, because this is online and I'll get in trouble with my colleagues at Oxfam, I haven't been head of research for a very long time. Uh, essentially, they sacked me because I couldn't, I messed up on a big report. And we had a difficult conversation where my boss said, we can't sack you because too many people read your blog. We need to come up with a job title that means absolutely nothing. So I said, strategic advisor. And they said, that sounds about right. So I've been strategic advisor with Oxfam for the last 10 years. That's the honest truth. Okay. Um, all right. So it's funny how you end up where you end up. Um, but I am a professor in practice at the LSE. Uh, and I'm going to talk you through it. That's the new Squid Games logo thing that I've just, okay. I've just been to the BA to the um, to the uh, career exhibition. So I'm kind of, oh yes, I know, I know what's going on there. Um, right, so let's get started. We're going to start with a video. How does that work? Do I click? No, no, we'll just hold that one. We'll, we'll play. Okay, yeah. we'll start with a video to demonstrate the problem, the image problem that AIDS has got, right? It's not, a new, it's not that recent. Some of you may have seen it, but I love it. So I'm just, it's only four minutes. I'm just going to show that. to be a volunteer, the show that's putting you on the front lines. I'm here with Lily, who's all the way from Europe, and she's one question away from winning the grand prize, a chance to save Africa. Lily, how are you feeling? I'm quite proud of myself. I didn't think I'd make it. Well, you pulled through well. Let's not waste any more time. Lily, are you ready? I was born ready. Let's play. Who wants to be a volunteer? Grand prize of a chance to save Africa? Answer this question. 
How many countries are there in Africa? Is it A, one, B, two, C, five, or D, 54? I know I should know this one. I just can't remember. This is the final question. You can't make a mistake now. I'll use my last lifeline. You want to use the Call an African Child lifeline? Uh, yes, please. Well, you've helped them so much. Let's see if they can help you. Let's get Michael on the line. Hello. Hello, Michael. What is it? What's up, Ben? Michael, I'm sitting here with Lily, and she's one question away from saving Africa. She needs your help. Lily, the time starts now. Michael, how many countries are in Africa? Is it A, one, B, two? Michael? Michael? I think it's frozen. Damn African line speeds. What was the question again? How many countries are in Africa? <laughs> help, was he? No. Well, Lily, we're almost out of time now. If you don't know the answer, you're just going to have to guess. Okay. Um, A. One. Final answer? Uh, yes. Well, Lily, looks like you're going to have to pack your bags. But you're not going home. You're gonna go save Africa. So that, that that was actually funded by Norwegian Aid, by the way. And they've got a whole series. Look at Radiate. They've got Africans sending radiators to Norway for the winter. And it's just got a lot of fantastic videos on uh, if you if you just want to laugh. Um, but the, the serious point, you know, the life saving complex, volunteerism, volunteerism. You know, there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there, which has led. And when it was put out about know, six, seven years ago, it was very funny. But when I look at it now, I think, wow, that's, you know, there is a real crisis of confidence in the aid business now. And uh, based on many of the, the things that that was satirizing. So perhaps it was just very successful. Anyway, apologies to John Lennon. Um, so uh, I thought I'd start with that as the title. Um, and uh, I won't go through that again. Cool. But let's let's start with some numbers. This is the idea. Yes, after all, facts still matter. Okay? Um, so uh, if you're in the UK or you're reading, you know, the, the atrocious destruction of what was once a really globally respected aid program, it, you can feel like aid is absolutely in free fall all over the place. It's actually a European free fall, very much. Scandinavia and the UK, new governments in Norway and Sweden cutting back. Severely, and the UK absolutely massacring. Talk about going down from 0.7 percent of gross national income to 0.3, and diverting a lot of that to Ukraine. Um, so, <clears throat> but that's these are the outliers. And for this side, you've got US, Japan, Italy, Germany boosting that. So it's more complex than just getting depressed because because Britain's so crap, right? There is still some hope outside these shores. Um, and actually, in 2021, and I just got these figures. If you have any figures on aid, the Development uh, 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 Assistance Directorate at the OECD are incredibly nice. You email them, and they send you back figures, up to date figures, that week. So bombard them. They, they want to be bombarded for good reasons, obviously. Um, they're really helpful. Anyway, they sent me these numbers. So um, up 4% in real terms in 2021 to you know, 180 billion dollars, essentially. So why give a talk about post cooperation or uh, post money cooperation or no money cooperation? A couple of reasons. One is if you take out COVID from those big numbers, and we don't know how much of that was, was COVID money, 
and you take out Ukraine, which in the first half of this year was up to 25%. They haven't got, they don't know how much of that is going to be put against ODA in national government accounting, but up to 25%. Then it doesn't look nearly as good. And that's, these are my events of the OECD. Um, and that, and again, you know, more and more demands from climate change um, uh, uh, disasters as well. So it doesn't look quite as rosy when you put that into the equation as that headline figure. And we look as though we're going into a uh, period of financial turmoil. Now, pre-2008, the experience of a large number of countries who had banking crises was it had this really interesting shape effect on their aid budgets. They would try to carry on, a bit like uh, in the Roadrunner cartoons, Wiley Coyote running off the cliff for a, for a couple of years, and then they go into a big hole for 15 years. But interestingly, it didn't happen globally in 2008, maybe because they sort of, um, uh, the, 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 the kind of counter uh, cyclical measures that governments were taking in their overall budgets also helped them defend aid budgets. I haven't really seen an analysis of why that didn't happen in 2008, but it's still a possibility that with a number of, potentially a number of financial crises coming, donor, donor generosity is going to go down as well. Um, but that's what we're going to say on, on quantity, right? So you've got diversion, possibly financial crises, eating away at a budget. Let's talk about quality. So the aid budget has a cake problem, right? And that, um, um, to make a cake, you need ingredients, a recipe, and an oven. And if you follow the ingredients, um, uh, follow the recipe, you've got the ingredients and the oven works, you can make a cake, right? Some cakes are lovely. My cakes don't look like that, but they are cake-like objects, which you can eat, right? Um, and that is the project. That's the basic model of aid, which is we know what to do. We can predict what we'll get at the outset, uh, in the end, from it. And if we follow this recipe, this best practice guidelines, this log logical framework, uh, this recipe, we will get there. So it's essentially a linear process. And there have been increasing questioning of these linear approaches to aid, the project based approach to aid, um, because the world looks like this. Right. This is a famous PowerPoint from 2003 from Afghanistan, where General Petraeus, who was head of the US military in Afghanistan, asked a consultant to help them refresh US strategy and do a <laughs> um, stakeholder map. Uh, and the consultant did this, right? came back with this, and General Petraeus sat him on the spot. Right? But actually, it was a really decent attempt to try and then show what is what any society or political system or economy looks like, which is it's a complex system with multiple feedback loops. Everything that influences everything else. And the nature of how these systems work and how change happens in these, in these systems does not lend itself to linear interventions. If you poke this system with a lot of USA or 10,000 US Marines, effects will ripple through. And no computer is smart enough and no PhD is smart enough to predict what will happen. And if the system changes, which it kind of changes over time, you cannot be entirely sure why. So you don't have prediction and you don't have attribution. And yet those two things are at the core of the project, of the, of the basic artifact of the aid system. So this has been recognized for a while and people have been trying different things, but they haven't been going very well. So one of them is say, look, you know, we're sitting in London or Washington or, or Brasilia or wherever. This isn't where the decisions are made. This isn't where the knowledge resides, the deep knowledge of those complex systems, which will actually enable you to intervene. So let's talk about localization, pushing power and decision making as close as possible to the people who are supposed to benefit from the aid. And this has been one of those things that people have been saying for years and years and years, and it's stuck. Right? And the, in humanitarian, we have about, I think, 30 billion about 180 billion, but it's a big and high profile bit of it. It's stuck at 3% of that 30 billion going directly to local organizations. Um, and it doesn't, all the, all the fine sounding words are not producing shift. The other area that I've worked on a lot, including uh, at IDS in the, in the um, uh, council, 
action for accountability and empowerment uh, research program is this thing which is very funky and very groovy, right? Adaptive management, thinking and working politically. And the basic idea about that is astonishing. It's if something changes when you're doing an A program, maybe you should change the A program, right? It's, it's radical, it really is. Um, and the idea there is that you, you iterate constantly and you think on your feet and you adapt the A program in order to uh, match, dance with the system, is the phrase of uh, Bernardo Meadows' uh, uh, phrase. And again, you know, everybody now says they do it, right? And so there's been a really impressive degree of adaptive washing in, in funding proposals and calls for, you know, calls for applications for funding. But how much of it is actually going on? I'm deeply skeptical about how much is, is really happening. There are some good examples, but they remain just isolated good examples. The basic reason is because money equals power. As long as you have one group of people, one institution or group of people giving money to another institution or group of people, the person who pays the piper will call the tune, right? And for all the good intentions, um, it's only ever, you only ever get to temporarily suspend that rule. We're not spam. Um, we have lots of affiliates right now, Northern affiliates, Southern affiliates. Um, and also, Great Britain is the biggest one, it's the first and the biggest. And a group of Southern affiliates a few years ago wrote and said, We need to separate finance from power. And I noticed that. So that's like saying we need to suspend gravity. You know, I mean, okay, good luck with that. And it can happen for short periods of time. But then a crisis hits or a scandal or someone runs off with some money or a donor gets worried. And you just revert to people with power calling the shots. So I think there's a real question mark about how much AIDS has been able to adapt to this recognition that its, that its model is, is broken. What about demand? Okay, so that was the supply bit. Um, where's aid coming from? What are people giving aid trying to do? What about demand? And here I think, yeah, just this is very synthetic. But the world has changed fundamentally from a 200 to a 100 world. This is the global distribution of income, right? <coughs> and the aid, the, 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 the mental map of the aid business is much closer to this than that. And the mental map is south, north, recipients, donors, or rich, then us, right? Um, and that's still up here, even though we're now here. Where you've got a global middle class, you've got a big middle class in an increasing number of developing countries, and it's a one home system. So I think there's a, there's a this, I mean, getting stuck here has meant we fail to recognize just how much the world has changed. So, uh, a friend of mine, Ingrid Schoener, um, who until recently was running a, a philanthropic center at Ashoka University in Delhi, has her team has just published this How India Gives. Study. And what she was looking at was Okay, forget aid, forget international aid. How much do people in India get for altruistic purposes? Um, and yeah, as I, I was struggling with crawls, I have to say, so I had to work it all out and kind of put it into um, billions. But it firstly comes out about $3 billion. They, they've counted. I'm pretty sure that's how they count it, because that's only two or three dollars per person in, in India. But you know, 87% of accounts are uh, surveyed, donate. Right. In India. And that's that's and that's far more than India received today. Well, I mean, another interesting study on zakat, right? So, um, uh, um, if you're a Muslim, you're supposed, uh, usually around Ramadan, to give a 40th of your wealth um, as uh, uh, in, in altruistic giving, and not your income, your wealth. So, that is serious amounts of money. It's been estimated at two trillion dollars, up to two trillion dollars a year. From Muslims worldwide. So that's about the country's answer. No one knows where it goes. A lot of it goes very locally, you know, putting somebody through school or uh, going to the local mosque or whatever. But just in terms of the amounts of money that are sloshing around in developing countries in the form of giving, there's many things which are as big or bigger than aid. You know, I'll just you know, leave it there. And we don't know much about it. And I fear that the kind of people we support, because they become dependent on aid, taking a long time to learn how to tap into these local sources of money. Um, one of the things that annoys me is we have all these without borders organizations and we have 
doctors without borders, most famously, engineers without borders, um, lawyers without borders. We even have a borders without borders for skateboarders. It exists. Um, we don't have a fundraisers without borders. At no point do we just say, great, why don't we send our most talented online fundraisers or uh, institutional fundraisers over just sit on them to some local organizations so they can tap into this kind of money? And now I came across one example of CAFOL who I used to work for, the Catholic Agency for England and Wales. And the Nigerian Caritas, the Catholic Agency in Nigeria, said to CAFOL, could you send a couple of people over? We need to sell raising money in Nigeria. And they couldn't cope with the volume of money that they tapped into. You know, I mean, this was this was possible. Um, so I just think we've become very blind to the rise of the past, the amount of altruistic giving, the possibilities for getting money locally. Doesn't come without strings. Money is power, right? But the strings are different than the strings uh, in A. Many shared challenges, right? Now, which of these are development issues? You probably can't read them uh, back, but these, it's kind of a fun thing I do. This is a table of what kills people worldwide, right? Um, children under five all causes, it's a big one, eight million people a year. The next one is tobacco, six million people a year, nearly all in developing countries. Is that a development issue? You wouldn't think so, looking at what the INGS work on or what the aid agencies work on. Child under nutrition, yes, okay, three and a half million. Overweight and obesity. Can you really see Oxfam becoming Ox fat? You know, it's, it's never going to happen, right? How on earth would you raise money for a campaign on obesity? Um, alcohol, Ox piss, you know, two and a half thousand, two and a half million, sorry, people dying from alcohol abuse. So, what you've got here is this is what actually kills people. But there's a kind of very selective application of what the aid industry sees, and it basically is the ones that are more exotic and the ones you can't find at home, which seems bizarre because the things we find at home are things we know what to do about, but we deliberately choose the things we don't know what to do about to work on. There's, there's kind of madness in there somewhere. Um, terrorism at this particular year, 13,000, but I'm going to go down that rabbit hole. Right. Um, so, I'm, so I'm arguing that there are many shared challenges which we could be much better at. So by starting with tobacco and alcohol. I mean, um, but there are also obviously massive global collective action problems. Finally, the obvious one, taxation, you know, making sure that people aren't paying one economy off against another, the race to the bottom in tax evasion, this kind of thing, arms control, access to vaccine, big campaign around access to COVID vaccines. Um, reviving much of the language and the campaigning tactics from the access to AIDS vaccines from about 20 years ago. Um, the general topic of rising inequality within and between countries and the migration system is an unholy mess. It always amazes me when I read, you know, history, which say that, you know, until 1900, I think, you could basically travel anywhere in the world without a passport. Um, you know, what, what on earth has gone wrong there? The system is completely, you know, what else is known? So let's say that money, this is only a thought experiment, right? I'm not suggesting that you cut my wage, right? Absolutely not. But let's say that we don't spend, if we don't need money, well, big money, anyway, big chunks of people, set them off the table, what would they, what could they even look like? One thing which has become very clear in the last few years is that aid agency after aid agency has decided that um, doing stuff, building stuff, digging stuff, handing stuff out is a short term solution when what they really want to do is influence the system. And usually that means the political system at national or subnational level. Um, it keeps changing its name, it used to call campaigns and it's called advocacy. Now we call it influencing, there'll be another name along soon. But this is the shift we're influencing. And here are just some examples that I've come across in my work. So, <clears throat> the killer fact, right? So, this is a uh, colleague at Oxfam who's now left, uh, Ricardo Fuentes, who just noticed that there were two databases he could compare. The database, which was the Global Distribution of Wealth, run by Credit Suisse, and the Forbes list of billionaires. So, he got the total assets of the poorest half of the world's population. And they went down the Forbes list, adding them up. It took him about a day, and he found that the 85 richest people in the world had the same wealth as the 300 billion people. 
kaboom. That is a killer fact to say juxtaposition which exposes an injustice and which the media love, right? And they published it on the eve of Davos um, seven or eight years ago, and it dominated Davos, it shifted the agenda. Suddenly everybody was talking about inequality. So this is that's what that's like. Everybody's screen has come up with the next, you know, Ricardo number. I mean, and we can't get loads of them, most of them sync without trace. And every now and then you get something deleted. But other things you, you flog away at, like I know that sort of people in Oxfam have been really working for years on the care economy, counting what goes on in the care economy, how do you put it on the policymakers' agenda? And they're getting somewhere. It's not as flashy as this, but it's like solid progress where it's more of a slog than, than, a, than a big stellar moment. Um, We've uh, done you know, MOOCs, Make Change Happen. So that was like a MOOC, which is for activists in North and South. We do no distinction. We've had about 10 million people do massive open online courses, but everybody starts with good intentions, and about 10 people actually finish it. Um, one of those, you probably signed up for some of these yourselves, some of you. Um, but it's, it's, you get a great conversation going across, across the North South. You know. Uh, spectrum, um, and we're planning to do a second version of that. And then at a higher sort of level in terms of the aid system, my main work this year has been on a this thing called the Global Executive Leadership Initiative, which sounds so boring, um, but actually it's been huge fun because what we do is get uh, senior aid people at national level, so the UN resident coordinators or heads of mission and the top NGO people and the top you know, national NGO people in Red Cross not governments, into a room and train them on this whole influencing thing. And they love it. They love it because they're away from their emails. They love it because they're learning new stuff. They love it because they're putting, they're systematizing what they've learned over 20 years. And the stories they tell are just phenomenal. Right? I mean, so we've had, yeah, the gender version is, you know, two or three times we've had men saying, yeah, I do all of this in the golf club. And then we go, huh, I'm not allowed in the golf club. We do it in the nail salons and the hair parlors, right? And, and you just find out where influencing actually happens. Um, and it's really interesting to find out how senior aid people do it. And they do it without training. They, 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 you know, so it's, it's good to systematize it a bit. It's, it's going very well. So these are examples of where A people aren't handing stuff out. They're actually thinking, how do you influence the politics, the policy, and increasingly the norms and the bigger picture? within which a project used to function. And then if we don't like projects, right? If projects are dead, you don't want to bake cakes, what else can we do? Um, and here are a couple of examples. I'm a huge fan of this thing, which absolutely is going nowhere in the end system. Positive deviance, right? So positive deviance says that in any country, community, system, you never get a complete straight line. You don't have all the kids that are equally malnourished or equally educated. You have a distribution, right? And what positive deviates is to forget the outside interventions and the aid projects and the best practice. Let's just go and see who's doing better than everybody else and then find out why. It's just such a good idea. Um, it started off, the, the iconic story is from Vietnam with Save the Children. Uh, in the in the early 90s, Vietnam had just uh, restored relations with um, Save the Kids, and uh, they didn't really like Save the Kids, so they gave them an impossible task. They said, you can come back in, but you have to halve malnutrition in three months. So these two, um, the two uh, Save the Children uh, people um, came in, had a fearless, young, crazy, and they've done, I think they've studied something about positive deviance, and they said, okay, let's give that a go. So they got the Vietnamese authorities to identify three villages where, um, which were very poor. They went to those villages, and they got everybody together, and the thing about Vietnam, on this party system, when people were asked to come to meet him, they'd come. So uh, they got them all into the room, and they said, are you poor? Yes, that's why you're here. Are your kids hungry? Yes. Are they all equally hungry? Right. So what we want you to do, uh, we want this group of people to just go and sit in the kitchens of your neighbours and see if you can spot anything different about how those kids are being fed. Because we won't, because we're foreign, you know, we don't we don't know the feeding practices, we don't know the cultural norms, but you might see something. 
And the people who did that found that the, the kids in the, the least malnourished kids were being fed slightly differently. They were being given um, soup from the bottom of the pot rather than the watery stuff at the top. They were being, the, the parents were putting in um, caterpillars and crabs from the paddy fields into the soup. So it wasn't, you know, so there was a bit of protein in there. But then the crucial thing was the Save the Children uh, people did not then start the Save the Children crab rearing project, <laughs> which would have been obviously a massive temptation. They just put this up in the commune hall and said, come and look at it. So the villagers came along and saw what was going on. They had explained to them that they didn't understand it. Um, and they said, we can do that. And they hired our nutrition in three months. And the amazing thing is, the only thing going on there is knowledge. No one's spending money right? beyond the project. You have to spend a bit of money on getting those people to facilitate the conversation. That's tiny money compared to an average aid project. And I've got a bunch of ones on my blog. You know, somebody looked at Kenyan primary schools and just got all the data and spot, you know, identified the outliers compared to in terms of their results, compared to uh, what you'd expect in their, their catchment area. And went to the study of them. Um, uh, Oxfam, I love this one, Oxfam Savings Project. They, um, they had a massive savings for change project in, in West Africa. And they, they employed an anthropologist <laughs> to go and ask the people in those saving projects what they weren't telling Oxfam, right? Because they just they thought, right, they're hiding something. And what they found out was in these uh, projects, which were getting when the villages were getting better results, the women who were running the savings program had set up separate savings programs for their daughters, but they hadn't told Oxfam because they were worried about child labor with Oxfam or disagree or something. And, and, and then that just gave them a new idea about how they could spread the savings program. But it was done by deliberately looking outside the normal reporting process. And why hasn't it caught on? Precisely because it doesn't need money. I mean, who's interested in it? In an, in an NGO, for someone to go and do a positive feedings. There is a sort of group of zealots um, uh, who work on positive feedings, and they say they only get invited in when everything else has failed. You know? These could you come and sort out female genital mutilation in Egypt? Sure, no problem. In they go. Right? And they say, and the, the briefing says, 97% uh, oh, of, of, of girls in Egypt are cut. And the positive deviance people say, great, let's talk to the 3%. And they find out what's, what's happening in those families. And they come up with a campaign based on that 3%. You know, it's just, it's such a genius idea. I can't believe it's not spread. Okay. Other things I think are worth exploring. I'm conscious of time, it's a little anxious. Um, if you've been in the aid business a while, um, what you notice is the same people coming up, but they have different projects attached. Yeah, they're running an NGO, they're running a think tank, they're running government, and they're back in an NGO, and a different NGO, and actually invest. The only thing you have to support them when they come up with a project is an incredibly inefficient way to support the change makers. I mean, just or a scholarship, right? This is not exactly a new idea, but I think there's a really good, strong case for it. And, you know, um, not least if you look at the MacArthur Foundation does this in the state with its big science grants. It identifies people who are going to do something interesting, just gives them a bunch of money and says, you know, just do your thing. Hank Rayworth, um, uh, who wrote Donut Economics, left Oxfam and got a grant from one of these kind of philanthropist groups to write down economics. He said, all oh, right, so, so I have to write a project proposal and a project report. And then the funder said, no, just send us a copy of the book. That, that, that's your project report. You know, the most effective, it's, you know, it's huge. So I think people on project, useful volunteers, not necessarily like Libby was it in the uh, video, um, but there are useful volunteers. You know, there was a really interesting one on accountants going and helping anti-corruption campaigns. Retired accountants going to go through the accounts and you know, crawl through government records or, or company accounts and try and help boost anti-corruption campaigns. I'm sure there are other areas like that where you can have exchanges of useful volunteers. Um, cash transfer is very popular. You know, we've suddenly realized giving people money brings dignity, allows them to make choices, uh, boosts local markets. There's a whole bunch of arguments behind cash transfers. But we're not applying that to organizations. Surely it's the same arguments apply if you, that you should do cap transfers for organizations. 
which is an organizational term to use core funding. Don't say, don't say you have to uh, give us your detailed project and you can't have anything for over it. Just give them the money and see what they do with it. Um, I think there's, if you go back to the, the causes of mortality, clearly some countries know more about tackling their places than others. The two most unsuccessful countries in the world, I think, are Mexico and the US, firstly followed by South Africa. So there must be more successful countries, right? So there, you can just clear all the signposting, saying, actually, if you want to know about obesity or tobacco or whatever, talk to these guys. And that might be a useful role for an aid agency or a university where you're just doing that, um, you know, a day, day post thing, signposting. And then this one's coming up a lot these days, strategic litigation. So there is a kind of growing body of law around social justice issues internationally. Um, things like climate change or obesity, or tobacco is the first really, um, and, and humanitarian law. And it's it's still not a kind of it's not like a solid body of law like you have at national level, but it's kind of emerging. And with it is coming, you're kind of doing strategic litigation at the international level and at the national level. So the, the lawyers are looking very happy these days, they can go on to you know, something big. But there is a certain place for global action. I'm not arguing that everybody should just who's not from the south or not from a, 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 a not working on one of these other issues should just pack up and go home. So there's global governments. You know, there's a there's a bunch of pretty dysfunctional international organisations which we need, uh, which we need to try and work on. There's um, there's if we take the money off the trade table, we can start having a genuine. There's this word partnership, which always makes me slightly nauseous. Um, in, in the aid business, normally it means I'm giving you money, please tell me what I want to hear. There's a lot of that, right? Um, but if you take the money off the table, you have a genuine partnership. You know, when I was at DFID, um, uh, I was really sad because um, a, an Indian NGO applied for funding from DFID to do capacity building of British NGO on trade. And I thought that's such a great idea. And DFID just said, that's it. It wasn't silly. It was a really good idea. So we can have that sort of conversation if we once we take money off the table. And then research. You know, I mean, there is clearly a place for research. We've just come to the end of a really interesting piece of work at Oxfam, where when COVID hit, we thought, well, we can't send people anywhere. And anyway, that feels very distracting these days. What else can we do? And what we did was just convene conversations around things which people we were convening identified. We just had a bunch of conversations about how are people showing up on the ground, emergent agency uh, on COVID. And we've got a paper coming out, a chapter of the book, and the briefing, and all the rest of it. Um, and it was really interesting and did not involve a lot of money. We got a little grant from uh, LSE to pay for the time of the people doing the convening. And basically, it was much more about using the network. And it was a very democratic exchange. People discussing what's going on in Ireland with people. Saying what's going on in the Philippines, and there wasn't some, you know, power gradient. Uh, it, was, it, was, it was a different experience. There'll always be bad guys, North and South, who need to be restrained. And one thing I would say, uh, which has gone up the agenda in the last you know, 15, 20 years, is norms, social norms. So we've got, um, you know, the global feminist movement is probably the pioneer on, on some of this, at least in recent history. Uh, but it spread to uh, child rights, uh, LG, nothing to lie, um, a whole bunch of other norms which have been challenged. Sometimes they lead to backlashes. There's a whole area of work. My students at the LSE, when I ask them to write their personal campaigns, which is what they're assessed on, far more of them are writing things on norms now than class struggle. I'm very sad about that. That's just the way things are these days. Um, and there isn't much to read. Right? But it's quite a, a there's lots of there's case studies, a lot of really interesting case studies, but it's not been theorized, it's not, you know, not been studied, and, and I think there's a lot to learn around how we shift norms. And with the money that does remain, because we're still going to need money for even for the things I talked about, smaller, but we're going to need it. Local money is in power. How do you support local organizations without undermining them? Really interesting work from Masuda Bama in Pakistan, who showed that you know you have these big membership based organizations, some either organization comes in and says, you're doing great work, have a million dollars, destroys them within six months. Because people say that the members say, oh, I get they're stealing the money. Even if they're not stealing the money, 
they get the impression and the money poisons the well. So you need to be able to give $10,000 and not a million, and the aid system really struggles with $10,000. Good to have me, you know, plenty of $10,000 out of Oxfam, good luck. You know, it's like a, a year's work, work of pain, and no, because you've just done it. Um, so we can't do money in the right way. Um, always, they, you know, do institutions voluntarily give up? I guess they do, actually, sometimes. You know, men voted to give women the vote at some point. Um, so there has to be a certain constellation of factors when that kind of thing happens. Um, but we need to be smart about how that happens. And making money less toxic. So this idea of pooled funds, where people put money in to a pooled fund, which is managed by local uh, worthies, uh, NGOs, or academics. And it's and you try and reduce the amount of uh, power imbalance by some mechanism. Um, there are ways to try and make it better. Final top tips. Um, still a role for global action. There's something different. So when I joined Oxfam in 2005, we just went on great. You know, we were marching from summit to summit, G7, um, WTO. Uh, you know, it's like a caravan with big heads of the global leaders and press releases. And, and I just, it's a really where change is happening. I read Matthew's book, which had a big impact on me, uh, the state they're in. You can't let it read it. Um, and it's got to be restricted to the places where it's needed and not get in the way of national change and national change movements. So it has to be restricted the way home. Ask partners, do you actually need aid? Because sometimes they say yes. You know, it's really interesting. Sometimes they say, get the hell out. Sometimes they say, please come in because you're giving us cover. Depending on the context, the government, the political situation, you can be an asset to local players, or you can be absolutely toxic. So you can follow listen, listen to local players. Um, Always think about where to power in this. So number, another guru, Bob Chambers, you know, his rule of thumb is in any conversation, there is an upper and a lower. And ask yourself, am I the upper or am I the lower? And I think that's just something we've got to keep in mind in all our interactions. Um, and then this one I think is really important. So what do you do if something has been going round and round? And round? Oxfam first promised to go urban, you know. In, uh, we had somebody actually did some sort of internal archaeology, uh, went through all the strategic plans. Oxfam first realized that more people were going to live in cities and uh, rural areas in 1989. And we still don't know what to do in urban areas, most urban areas. And there's a whole bunch of reasons for that. But instead, what we do is just say, well, we really need it this time. And in each successive strategic plan, we were about to go urban. Right? So you need to think, why is that? Is it ideas, institutions, interests? What are the blockers for a change which has been promised endlessly and never to the localization being the current one? Um, digital and tech. Um, I know it's probably works on um, uh, the, the politics of that thing, right? So that's the way to do it. Think, yeah, it's not a power free zone. There's still inequalities, massive inequalities. We all become a lot less sort of. Um, yeah. Uh, boosterish about the power of IT, but it does, it has had some extraordinary impacts during COVID. It's transformed the way, a lot of ways that civil sort of society groups work. So it's just, just being sort of looking at it soberly uh, rather than getting overexcited or, or too far humbug, old manish about it. And then my two gurus, John Lennon and Robert Chambers. Um, I love that picture of Robert. I don't know what he was doing there, but anyway, um, I'll leave you with that and um, we'll go to questions. That's great. Yeah, good round. Okay, that was the reason why Rob James is the most great writer, he's a terrible poet, and he writes awful doggerel in some of his books. And I, I accused him of that and said, Absolutely. Okay, thank you very much. That was, it was very reflective, self reflective, I think, and of, of the situation that's happened. I took away power, I took away aid, I took away knowledge. And also, I work in the policy area, and that's definitely out of the box, a lot of the things you were saying, because it's all driven by money. Uh, so, uh, that would be an enormously welcome debate to have. Now, we have a lot of people online, Gary, how many? It's, it's or, or Shay, how many? 
it's it's a large number, so we can. Yeah, we've got sixty four online. Right, so we can take. We're going to take questions both from the floor and online. Now, I'll ask Duncan to lead uh, the people that want to speak. You can bring them in yourself, so you can you can manage that process. Okay, uh, but just be aware, everyone. We've got about we've got until basically until uh, sort of five twenty five. OK, so maybe we can have a couple of questions from the floor first. And we, if you if you do, maybe raise your hands, do speak into the microphone because this has been recorded and everything else. And then maybe we'll have a couple of people from online. Is that something? Is that Duncan? Can you wait? Yeah, so you're raising your hand the microphone. I will do, yeah. OK, right. But wait, if you get called, wait until you get a mic, otherwise it won't be on the mic. OK, cool. I'll just take the time. That's all. all right. Okay. Questions? Yes. Hi, Julia, Associate IDS. Um, not so much a question as a couple of comments, really. One on trust-based philanthropy and flow funding, which are really big in the States and becoming bigger here, where philanthropists actually approach you and say, can I fund you? And here's money, core funding, you can do it. Would you accept my money rather than the other way around? Um, and a real movement in the States pushing that forward and groups pushing it forward in the UK which was mind-blowing for me and actually took a while for me to get my head around. And the other is to say that the World Food Programme is working on obesity, actually. Okay, I said NGOs can't, can't be. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'm there. Hi, uh, I'm Maddie. I just graduated uh, my master's here at IDS, and now I got a job at Save the Children oh. International. So I, was, I thought, oh, might as well come. It'll be good. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, I was kind of wondering about localization because that's a big thing that I'm hearing now joining Save the Children. And um, I was wondering, can it be part of the solution in terms of aid? Um, is the problem just that not enough of the funds are going there, or is it just because power isn't actually shifting when they're using those terms. Okay. Uh, take one more, and then I'll just do the next one. Yeah. Next one. Uh, hi, I'm Philip Prabhupada. I'm a research fellow, and I'm in the uh, Humanitarian Learning Center at IDEA. So I found this very interesting because it's a lot of the questions we argue about all the time in, in the center. Um, I'm going to reflect a little bit on, on on Yemen because I think it raises some problems with uh, with your proposition. So, so what? How how do we do this? How do you do these shifts in situations of complicated, protracted emergencies, where you have large political players involved that limit what what the humanitarian response can be? So, if you look at Yemen, who is the south to south actor there? Is it Iran giving aid to the Houthis, or or is it the Saudis? who do not want to see any progressive shifts in the aid system. They're very happy to keep it on life support. And then that makes me wonder about things like, you know, positive deviance in that context. When we were, I was involved in the IAHE of the Yemen response. And when we were looking for places where there was little child malnutrition, often we found it's because they had a very good harvest of cut, which meant they were getting more cash into the economy. And it was a cash-based a cash based economy, so they were able to buy more food. How do you scale that up and how do you convince people that, you know, actually Yemeni should be growing more cart or we should be supporting cart production? Because that's the realist response to where was there, where was there not this situation? And, and then I wonder about the nature of, 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 of pooled funding and things like this, because I agree with you about that. And when I'm look, when, when one of the suggestions we had coming out of that was that there should be a single protracted crisis fund which different agencies, I know you said NGOs, but agencies could dip in and out of, mm -hmm. and then that would get around the, the predicament. But then you still come up to the political situation, which is nobody wants to see aid, no one wants to see the nexus in a situation of complicated, protected emergency, because it's not in the, it's not in the interest of the Saudis to see the Houthis rebuild their legitimacy or build their legitimacy through providing services. So then I think maybe we should just be kind. What frustrated me the most is, uh, sorry, I'm starting to talk a bit too long, but to be kind to the system, sometimes I felt that in the evaluation where we saw if they just did small changes within the existing system, it would produce some sort of good. So for instance, you mentioned AAP. They tried to do it for two years and stopped. So my recommendation, I did the accountability section, was start doing AAP again. They had the systems all set up and just do it again. 
Didn't declare the AAP for the public. Uh, or uh, accountability to affected populations. And then other things is just go out and look at things. They stop going out to look at things. So I, I, there were sites that clearly, if someone had just seen as you know an over, overflowing sewage system that they'd built, so is there not a space also within the system to just encourage better practice? And is that not the best we can do in sort of these complicated, protracted situations where how? Sorry, that's too long, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> solving the end of the first. Uh, yeah. um, so yeah, some of the core parties of these programs are interesting, and uh, it is there are some low profile good stuff working on the back of that in the um, other piece of the um, localization. It should be part of the solution, and in some cases it is. It is. Save is doing interesting stuff. Save the world is doing interesting stuff. Um, but it's it's always kind of swimming against the tide. So I guess if you're swimming against the tide. You sort of come into shore where the tide's not so strong, and then you make more progress. So I guess people have to demonstrate the value of localization in places where there are fewer compliance risks, for example. And then maybe it can spread, right? Or the value of localization when they that can also include raising more money locally. So there's more middle income countries rather than the really poorest. You don't start with localization probably in Yemen, right? Or, or in DLC, which is just the hardest places to do stuff. Unfortunately. The aid business, for quite good reasons, is moving towards working in the places where aid is least affected, the fragile and conflict affected states, um, because the other countries are kind of getting on with things and um, growing out of aid. But that means that the aid business is stuck you know, in, the, in the failure zone more and more. So it is, it is hard, but I think that, that thing about trying to demonstrate the value of it. Um, we've done some interesting stuff in the Philippines, uh, setting up a humanitarian network in peacetime. The point is, and maybe this comes back to the Yemen question a bit as well, these reforms are much easier to do in peacetime rather than in the eye of the storm, to mix my metaphors, right? Um, so we set up and supported the creation of a humanitarian network of Filipino organizations. And they were, and, and as long as the, the, the disasters weren't massive, it went really well, they were able to respond, we just channeled money through them. But then at some point there was a massive typhoon and they got big footed, as the phrase goes, in, from journalism, where you know suddenly it was too much money, too big a scale, and they got pushed aside and the you know the, the macho um, uh, humanitarian machine came in. So but building that slowly uh, and, and state capacity as well. Uh, and one of the things I think we've not done well is realizing who do local people turn to in these situations. Mm -hmm. So I remember from the Haiti earthquake, um, the research showed that the first place people went to after the Haiti earthquake was their churches of different faiths. Um, and they had never been on our radar in terms of disaster risk reduction, in terms of response. You know, we, we were in NGOs, so we were with NGOs and civil society organizations. But actually, if in those situations, it's all about trust and who you trust. You can trust their churches or their mosques. So um, we had a you know, hilarious example of Mache after the uh, big um, tidal wave and tsunami in 2004, where we went in and said, this was during the rebuilding phase, and said to people, um, we've got some money. You decide. You decided to be participatory. You decide how to spend this money. And one group of people said, well, oh, great. We want to rebuild the mosque. And Oxfam went into a kind of, um, I wish I hadn't said that. Um, and in the end, we said, Okay, as long as you call it a community center. <laughs> and so they said, fine, whatever. And it was a community center. You know, the community gathered on the mosque and that village, you know, rebuilt faster than others. But we just had this terrible secular blind spot, which was a real problem. So I think getting over that would help as well. You know. Yemen, I mean, come on, give me a break. <laughs> I mean, um, I suppose it's an interesting question, Pat, actually, on, on, on that's the. Uh, the mild narcotic which um pays very well to grow it um but if that's the only way you can uh reduce poverty is it worth it and it, it might be you know there's a massive discussion going on about legalization of coca growing across latin america it might be worth it in terms of yeah, easing the uh, the crisis um and actually yemen came up when when we were designing that program the the, the gelly the, the executive leadership initiative program 
Because one of the UN people said, well, you know, we get, we get promoted in the UN system for being good at tents and blankets. And then we have to stop the Saudis from bombing Yemen. And we have no idea how to do that. So I think there is something to be said for more dipl humanitarian diplomacy, influencing, but, you know, within huge constraints about what we can do somewhere like you know, We did some really interesting stuff in Yemen during a calmer period around early marriage. So we went in with a very sort of women's rights agenda on early marriage, it got absolutely nowhere. And then some very smart Yemeni staff said, well, let's reframe this. Let's talk about it as a health issue. And that just got absolute pickup. We ended up training future imams about the health risks of early marriage. And so you can find ways in by understanding the difference, but in the middle of a war like this, where it's so polarized, I think it's pretty. I mean, my, there'll be some areas where you just have to get food in. And it's as hard as ever. Um, okay. Oh, one other thing in that, though. Um, so I don't know whether it's, I haven't read about this recently, so it's probably been discredited by now. But um, during the Afghan war, there was a really interesting program called the Afghan National Solidarity Program, where uh, they gave $20,000 to any community that came up with a, pro, a, a community development program on anything. And the only conditions were it has to be decided by the community. I'm not happy to find that IDS would have had a field day with that one. Um, and it has to be uh, audited. But otherwise, you can have a basketball court, you can have a mosque, you can have whatever you want. And that was always said to be one of the few successful bits of reconstruction in Afghanistan after the war. So I don't know, maybe something like that again. Eventually, maybe not right now. Should we say so, some more one? Yeah. So we've got a couple online. Um, so the first one is, um, should we give a basic amount of money to all human beings, i.e. universal basic income, to promote agency, economic democracy, dispersion of power and personal freedom? Would you like the other one as well? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, going back to your ODA graph, what would be your advice to government aid officials who may be working in more cash constrained environments? Is that from a government aid official working in a cash constrained <laughs> <laughs> Um, All right. Okay. So, universal basic income. I'm. Um, you've been working on this in South Africa, so maybe you should come in on this, but um, I've, I've not been following this closely. I mean, it's an extension of the social protection, kind of the spread of social protection, cash transfers, also familia in Brazil, you know, um, and the idea is you give everybody a certain amount. So the question is, how big is the certain amount, and is it big enough to make a difference? And what would that do to the national accounts and, and, and that sort of question? So I read things saying you can you can only afford an amount that basically makes a major difference to most people. You were saying South Africa is targeted at the moment, so yes. so the argument. Sorry, eighteen to fifty-nine euros. Eighteen to fifty-nine. Yeah. Okay, not that targeted. Then. <laughs> 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 we'll get a few child in old age. Okay, and then they go straight to a pension. That's kind of wild. Um, so I don't know. I think it's it's really interesting. It's spreading, but it's they did an experiment with film, which didn't go to the you well, I understand. So um, um, uh, anybody else working on this knows more than me, but I don't know very much clearly. No? All right. Um, advice to government officials in cash constrained environments. You have a hobby? Um, uh, wait. Um, and what they say about so if you think that the pendulum is going to swing and that aid is going to come back, then you're talking about getting policies and institutions in place, which means that when there's more aid, it will be used better. So now would be the time to put in place policies on localization if you can. Uh, they won't be so hard fought over because there's not so much money attached. Um, uh, scholarships, these kind of, you know, any of these ideas are easier, to, it's almost easier to do when they're small, when there's not a lot of money at play. If you think that that's a permanent state of affairs, and the money is never going to come back, uh, then I'd say you need to look at these non-cash approaches to it. One of the things which is really frustrating is that in several countries, UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, they squish together 
development departments and foreign ministries, right? And so, so what you think is great, right? Because what do foreign ministries do? They do, they think and work politically, they're diplomats, they think about power, they think about you know um political economy analysis, they they get this, right? They're they're not they're not just kind of checking out bed nets or vaccines or something, they're actually thinking about politics. But somehow that doesn't carry across. Whether it's because the, the, the political minds are only thinking about the politics of their own governments, um, which was a conversation I had with Australians last week, or is it because the field of aid is dominated by medics and, and traditional economists who have a particular way of thinking and come with all the paraphernalia of stuff, r and T's, uh, randomized control trials, and particular ways of, of doing aid, and they're very resilient to changing their way of thinking. But it's those big mergers have not don't seem to have led to a big change in mindset within the eight bits of those ministries. So maybe advice to that cash constrained person is um, bring in the skills from from their diplomatic colleagues and have that come get that conversation going because it doesn't seem to be going very well at the moment. <coughs> We're back in the movement, right? Hi, uh, thank you for such a, an inspiring um, presentation. Uh, my name is Jay Park. I am a senior tutor here at IDS. Uh, just finished, I shouldn't say just anymore, but I uh, finished my PhD here at IDS in January and I've been teaching a lot. And um, I was reflecting on a couple of points that you've made on um, investing in people, not projects, um, and the two humps to one hump. And also reflecting on the fact that a lot of my students from the previous years and the challenges they face in accessing the job market. Are there far too many of us development professionals in this world, in the space of the shrinking aid industry? Um, and perhaps, I don't know, because it, it just feels paradoxical that the more I you know, get a job, advance and get paid higher, like how much of that is taking up what actually should be going towards changing the world and, you know, you know, should I be advocating for the advancement of all our careers or you know, should aid industry go bust? Hello. Yeah, thank you very much for your lecture. I'm from Mongolia. I study at Development Studies Ideas. Yeah. And my question is, I work at very grassroots NGO and lately I've seen this trend in my country that the international agencies are started cooperating together to um, conduct their project in my country. So I think in my opinion, um, there is disadvantage for like local NGOs and local people on that trend, I think, because they when they cooperate together and when they combine their money, <laughs> right? So in I think, it will like disadvantage us, of course, in terms of the the broad broaden of their work, etc. I think, and even uh, even for some other like um, international funding uh, like opportunities, they also apply together. So when they combine together and apply, they of course become powerful than us, right? Yeah. And do you think this is right or yeah? So it's it's, in the lab, right? it's yeah, it's like they're combining together and cooperating together in in terms of applying for the international fundings, etc. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Great question. Um so I think if if the way we teach development students is to be project managers. Um, then yes, many people, um, and especially if they're from here um, in the global north, then I'm not quite sure. I'm not going to have that great a future, except if those schools are transferable. Right? So yeah, it's probably going to be managed in the UK. Right? Um, so uh, they may well be able to use those skills to both potential and realize what we do. So we look at where the uh, students end up. 
The things he studied on where they study graduates in Canada and that. Uh, and then we uh, talked about it. It's so about having the capital of the skill and it was a big question in mind um, rather than, you know, not about like engineering. And we're not using a particular you know, fix set of, uh, of skills. Um, I'm lucky who I teach master at LSE so you know, basically you can't work the world and you be rich. Uh, it seems to be the uh, main, main uh, criteria for uh, being able to get the so much. Um, uh, so uh, they got really interested in ideas about what they were doing in North America and after you know, uh, in, 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 in the minorities in the European. I don't have to say anything. So, but um, for those of you who are from Britain, uh, next slide, I see the minority. Yes, yeah, question. It's a question. Um, uh, well, I don't know, I'm sorry, that's what you say. But um, my kids very rapidly decided that it was nothing to do with this, um, and they both worked on social change in the UK. And I was very relieved, to be honest, because I thought, you know, that, 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 that's, that there's always going to be a future for that. Right now, bigger future than ever. Um, so that was uh, a good decision. Um, that's really interesting. Really, so, right, so when you look at that, does it actually post it to? It can be all sorts of different things. It can be, sorry, it can be, um, it can be also set up a local option. And they say, hey, you're cool. And you're always going to be cool. And oh, that, you know, the local years. Um, I haven't heard of this site. In Boise, local option and local state, they can form a kind of public sector. And then there is more effective of the reality. So there is a real question there. And, and it's genuine, not only India. It's actually India. You know, it's an Indian board, Indian staff, they're in the white man in shorts to be too. Um, uh, but everybody in India is still saying that they're the biggest in India. And they're really annoyed. So I think that can be very fun. But I guess the one. You should be, and then the, another level of complexity of that is we're going to provide money with our partners, but all the core funding is just going to happen to come to the end. I don't know who partners would be good at this. Or, you know, research firms, I'm interested in your research. You may have all the local knowledge, all the languages, do all the work, but my name is in the bank. So, then that, yeah, it, it's not just an A thing, right? Um, so then you have to challenge because I think that one thing that has happened is that a lot of organizations in the communities know there's a problem, they've been beaten up a lot. But if you challenge them, they won't be very trying to do it. You know what's interesting? More coming. More coming. Okay. So, I mean, challenge them to what they say. You know, they, they might just not have thought about it. Everybody knows that the problem. Um, but you have these decisions that have a money for it. Yeah? So at the same time, you know this problem, you want to do the right thing, and your fundraising thing is on the case because you haven't raised that money this year. And also, you have to raise a certain amount of money so that the 7% or 12% of the revenue you take means you can keep paying the wages because otherwise you're going to sack people. And that's no fun for anyone. So you can see how the incentives and the interests go against your moral. Or political direction, but at least engage in that conversation. Are there any more follow questions? Yes, we do have a couple more. Um, um, so the first one is how to make global institutions, um, UN, IMF, AIIB, and the uh, INGOs um, more responsible for their decisions. <laughs> not coming back. Um, and then the um, other one is do we need more appropriate societal development goals such as gross national happiness, such as in Bhutan, um, or societies which aim for well being rather than growth of gross domestic product? Okay. Yes. Right. Um, so. <laughs> Clearly, the, the institutional reform, yeah, and 
the UN has been talking about reforming itself for decades. Um, as that famous quote it's quite clearly showed that you know the UN wasn't created to take us to heaven, it was created to save us from hell. Um, and that's how it feels some of the time. Um, but it's worth applying those, you know, the how change happens influencing kind of analysis to how does reform of these institutions work well. It's uh, often uh, comes after a crisis. So the humanitarian system typically evolves through failure, right? Rwanda, for example. Uh, then there's a big conversation and people make commitments and say this can't happen again. And each time there's a major screw up um, and the humanitarian system tries to reform itself. So if you're trying to influence that system, you have to jump on the next disaster, the next crisis. Think, how do we how do we, how do we actually have impact now? Because that's when the decision makers uh, become more open to reform and change. So there is part about being, um, Pasteur said, fortune favors the prepared mind, right? So you have to have prepared mind, prepared policy briefs, prepared whatever, for when there's misfortune in terms of the humanitarian system. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, how on earth are you going to try and reform the UN Security Council? Yeah, it's probably, uh, yeah, it's, it's a crazy task. Um, you can, it might be more productive to try and think about, think regionally, because there's this whole intermediate tier of both established regional bodies, which are becoming more and more important, like the African Union, or um, ad hoc alliances. So you've got this variable geometry going on increasingly at international level. I'm not an IR person, but I know that you know, it's no longer just global this and nation states. It's much more fluid than that. And think about how you work with that. In terms of if you're working with civil society, it's about how you navigate that, those the, the, the multiple levels. And there's some yeah, great work from IDS. Um, uh, some of their uh, work about 10 years ago on, on how you uh, on, on how the effective people are able to move between the World Bank and the village and all the steps in between and link people up. And it's that kind of work that actually seems to get some impact. But these are major, very difficult uh, reform exercises. Gross national happiness, well being. Um, there was a big flurry of discussion about this about 10 years ago, 15 years ago. And I went to an absolutely crazy meeting in, in, in South Korea, where we, were, we as our day out, we were all taken up to visit a, a Buddhist monastery and, um, and, and meet the, the abbot. And I said, Abbot, how do you define well-being? <laughs> I thought, well, maybe give us a tip. And he said, did you like your tea? I'm like, yes. <laughs> that is well-being. Cheers, mate. <laughs> um, so yeah, don't ask adults to help you with your indicators, my learning from that. Um, so there was a debate between uh, Joe Stiglitz and uh, Layard, um, Richard Layard, at that meeting about what do you do? And uh, if you, uh, everyone agrees, everybody you know, dumps on GDP, GDP, bad, bad, bad. So okay, fine, let's just take that as granted. So what do you do? And uh, Layard said, throw it away, Come up with gross national happiness. Come up with just like get people to say how happy they are. Um, and, and, and there's quite a sophisticated ways of measuring that. You have to have deflators for people being Australian because they're always really too happy compared to where they should be. And Indonesians are always really depressed compared to where they So it's like there are some cultural issues you have to deal with on this. Um, but uh, that, that was his argument. You could you could make that work, right? And Joe Stigler said. And that's just very wishy washy. You need dashboards of indicators, right? Now, 60 different indicators about what people value in their lives. And then you can construct, get people to construct um, their own, their own indicator, indicator for overall well being. And we were involved with some really interesting work in Scotland on that, where we just, you know, we just got sat people down and said, What matters to you? Let's, let's make it, let's, let's actually come up with an alternative to, to GDP. Based on that, and it's been adopted by the Scottish government in terms of some policy work. And people, yeah, it turns out relationships, no, ki no kidding, wow. Um, you know, roof on your house, you know, food security, that they came up with some fairly, you know, sensible things. And we turned it into an indicator and 
uh, it came up with the wrong result, right? Which showed that things were getting better, which if you're an NGO is disastrous. Because obviously as an NGO, you want things to be getting worse because then you can do a campaign. Um, but we went with it anyway, even though it came up with the wrong result. Uh, and the Scots government have been using it. So that was interesting. But then, the problem then is that quite rightly, every country, every province, every town, every village, every household will have a different indicator. Right? It's genuinely rooted in their lived experience of what they're doing. It's going to be completely uncomparable. And at which point you start saying, well, then why waste all that time measuring stuff? So I think there's a sort of slight self-destruct quality in it. Um, about, and so I don't know what the compromise is, but we all agree that GDP is rubbish. Right? <laughs> yeah. Back to the room. Yeah. Oh, do I have to ask you? You're chairing it. Well, okay. Yes. In the power. Tell us your name. Oh, yeah. Duncan, I'm, I'm going to be a little bit. Um, uh, I don't come from the aid area. Okay? I come from more the policy innovation area, and uh, and, and I'm, I'm not going to talk a lot. But this is this is where I I agree completely with what you're saying. But let me just uh, push you on the limits of this in terms of taking the money out. Will how far can we go with this? Because there's an issue of knowledge here, and, and this is my experience, which is that the knowledge that comes from legitimate, so-called legitimate areas, such as uh, the rich north in many cases, is, is held to higher esteem in many cases than, than that of, of, of the south. So we were talking about Colombia and Petro, who does he get to orientate his policy, Mariana Matsukato, you know, everybody from outside, okay? Now, um, and, and I'd, I'd, I'd suggest to you that if no money was going there and there's a lack of ideas, they would pay us. Some of the governments would start paying the rich countries to get some ideas. Please, please tell us what, please help us. Now, I'm not sure, I mean, it doesn't have to be like that, but there's the issue that outside is seen as legit, legitimate, uh, it's neutral. So in other words, it's out of the power politics. And there's a load of cultural things around coloniality and, and so on and so forth. There is something else that we have more time to think here sometimes, um, as academics sometimes, when, when this is my experience as academics, that I talk to my colleagues over there and they're so full up of pressure and everything and the conditions of work are different. And so the ones that are writing the papers and so on. So I, I, I completely agree with you, but how to change, the, there are fundamental underlying issues here that um, how far do you think we can go with that? I mean, you may completely okay. disagree with this, but but right, that's a big one. But let's thanks. Yes, Peter Taylor from IDS. Um, I'm excited to know there are academics in the UK who have time to think. That's brilliant. That's really good, that's really, that's really, that's really good news. Um, no, um, I was just thinking some of the ideas, Duncan, you're sharing are things which have happened and already happened to some extent. I was thinking of your organizational cash transfer core funding. So, you know, there are organizations, including IDS, that used to receive that. Um, I managed a 10 year program that provided about hundred million pounds to think tanks in Asia, Africa, and Latin America as core funding. And after that program finished, um, the kind of tide turned and funders were not interested in that anymore. Three weeks ago, I, in the same week, I had conversations with two funders, one bilateral and one multilateral, both of whom, again, were thinking about this. And I did my signaling free of charge and put them in touch with each other. Hopefully they've talked to each other now. But the thing is that that tide effect is quite challenging because organizations and institutions adapt to suit the circumstances of funding flows and models at the time. And when the tide turns and that availability stops, whatever it might be called funding or other kinds of longer term support, they, they have to reboot their structures and their systems, often to the detriment of people that they employ. Um, you know, it's very difficult to recruit and retain staff when people are constantly coming in and out because the funding flows are there and then at the same time as 
you know, it's great that I hear uh, some funders now who again are thinking about unrestricted long-term flexible funding, but at the same time, other funders are, you know, doubling down on the use of RTTs again, and that is not compatible with longer term flexible funding because the metrics and the indicators that they want to see in terms of effectiveness of their funding use doesn't line up very well with more flexible you know funding so these waves keep coming and they're intersecting cancelling cancelling each other out organizations in contexts where they really value and can use that those resources are catching waves and then being dumped in the sand when the wave recedes and it's happening over and over again how do we how do we get consistency in our approach okay um yeah i'm really interested that northern knowledge is how to hire a steam um what do you do about that well one of the things they countries do is send people to places like lsc and ids so um at least they'll have nationals who can yeah expose themselves in the unwarranted glamour, at least in terms of the LSE, which was warranted here, uh, of, the, of the brand. Um, but then you said something really interesting, they would pay us. And then that reminded me of a really interesting proposal, which wasn't a serious proposal from Danny Roderick a few years ago. What if we divided the World Bank into six, the policy arm, gave a bunch of money to developing country governments, and they decided who they want to employ? That would just cause mayhem at the bank and it would put the power in the hands of the developing country governments and they could actually get advice they wanted rather than the advice we thought was good for them and something a bit similar has happened with some of the in some of the big diffid research grants like the international growth center which effectively acts as consultancy and governments approach them and say well get some help sorting out our ports or something like that and it's not driven by someone's need to get published. It's not driven by a research agenda established elsewhere. It is actually driven by need. So I think there are models where they pay, them paying us or them being in charge of how that money is spent at least uh, would result in better outcomes. Um, <clears throat> yeah, it also raises the whole question about, I mean, this is a hobby horse of mine, but, um, how much research actually has useful impact? And I have regular fights with colleagues at IDS about this because I think sometimes IDS language is quite amicable. Um, and you like turning out all singular words become plurals for some reason. So it's knowledge is and what is that? Um, and um, I think there's a whole bunch of things about uh, how you design research to actually be useful to policymakers and have impact. Which is despite the research excellence framework and proposal will be attaching 25% of funding for it, I failed to catch on. So I think I, I, yeah, it's good for me because I endlessly get asked to do the research for impact talk. Um, and I'll probably always will because it'll never actually land and no one will do anything different. Um, one thing I, yeah, we're getting into grey beers territory now, but what I've realized and I learned from uh, Robert Chambers and people. Never say we tried this in the 1970s, right? <laughs> I mean, you're too young, you don't have this problem, but as you get older, never say we tried this two decades ago and it worked or it didn't work. Always say, fantastic, great new idea, right? And if you're actually promoting that idea, don't say, can we do, can we go back to doing this? Always come up with a new name for it, okay? Because then people get excited and people don't think, oh, we're just going backwards. So it's, it's got to be a spiral more circle, people. Um, so there is a branding issue around these things where, yeah, yes, of course, we've done uh, core funding, but we've got to give it a new name. Cash transfers for things, like whatever. You know, and, it, and, and it's just, yeah, it's just been a spin off but it, it's remarkably effective. And preferably make the person who's got the money think they thought of it first. <laughs> Basics of influencing. Um, yeah. I'll end um, uh, with a story. Uh, about this, uh, from about the, 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 what you were talking about, the power of money and how an institution had shaped shifts the following from two good friends at IDS. Thanks. <laughs> um, sorry, guys, not you. But, um, so, uh, one of my favorite authors at IDS is Roz Ivan, who was a troublemaker of Diffie. 
uh, and um, great books on feminism in the, feminists in the aid industry, which I absolutely recommend. Some great studies of how aid actually works compared to the theory, great stuff. And when she came to IDS, she got really fed up with this the log frame, the, the RCTs, the pressure for this particular way of thinking about change and aid. So she got a bunch of co conspirators and they organized the big pushback. They were going to have a conference called the big pushback. And just as they were about to announce the conference, she was summoned to Lawrence at that office. And Lawrence said, We're just about to agree a seven million pound or whatever it was grant from Dick. This is not happening. And when Ros came out, it had been rechristened the big push forward, <laughs> which means absolutely nothing. <laughs> but was Dick incompatible? So if even Ros agrees to change when the funding yeah, is there, you can see how difficult it is to buck the trend when there's big money on the table. So I totally I feel your pain, uh, feel everybody's pain, especially the guy, the person on mine. Um, with the uh, constrained circumstances. Um, we have to dance clever. Uh, when there's little money, you can probably make more reforms to the money bit. When there's good politics, you can make reforms. You, you just have to dance with the system and think smart and not into, uh, I'm a big skeptic about speaking truth to power. I, I think um, you have to be savvier than that. Um, and that's what I hope we can do is current cash constrained moment. I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much. Okay. That was great. I hope you all enjoyed it. I certainly did. And thank you, Duncan, for coming. Just one more thing. I'll put my glasses back on. Uh, so the next Sussex, Sussex Development Lecture is on the 9th of November, if I'm not mistaken. And the title is Development Banks are a route to building. This sounds a bit caustic title. Uh, Building regional and global solidarities. That's a statement. I don't know if it's sarcastic anyway. Uh, and there's a whole series of really good speakers coming along. So 9th of November, please. Um, that's the next uh, Sussex Development Lecture. Thank you very much. Thank you.